All right, welcome everyone. I am Karen Fletcher, Director of Grants, Resources, and Services in the Office of Research, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's research forum focused on research scholarship and creative activity at the intersection of STEM and humanities. These research forums are organized by the Office of Research and are designed as an opportunity to build our research community here at Appalachian. It's a space where we come together and share research being worked on in different disciplines yet around the same topics. Uh, you can find previously recorded research forums on the Office of Research's YouTube channel, and we'll drop that link in the chat here momentarily. When I stop talking, I can drop that in the chat. But I'm excited today to present our, our presenters um, and to introduce our presenters. Uh, we have Savannah Page Murray from English, Nicola Villaviel from Applied Design, Rebecca Witter from Sustainable Development, and Richard Alaver. I uh, know I didn't say that right. Alaver. Um, I think I got that right. Okay. <laughs> From Applied Design. Um, thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to have you here. And I'm going to turn it over to Savannah Page Murray. And the title of this presentation is The Dam Fighters, Grassroots Activism and Environmental Rhetoric Along the French Broad River. Great. Thank you, Karen. And thank you all for being here today. I'm just going to go ahead and share my slides real quick and get set up. So yeah, I am Dr. Savannah Page Murray. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of English. I'm an environmental rhetorician, which means my research explores the intersection of language and communication use and the built environment in particular. Um, so what I'm talking about today is my current book project about grassroots activists who successfully opposed um, and prevented the implementation of 14 Tennessee Valley Authority dams in West North Carolina between 1960 and 1971. But broadly defined, I'm going to talk a little bit about archival research, what environmental rhetoric means, and how I use it and some implications for grassroots activism. So yes, as I said, I'm assistant professor in rhetoric and writing studies in the Department of English here at App State. I earned my PhD in 2020, yes, 2020, <laughs> um, in rhetoric and writing from Virginia Tech. And that programmatic focus is on rhetoric and society. So that program really trains us as scholars to think about the ways that language use um, and everything from technical documents to social media posts um, intersects with issues in the in, and society writ large and my focus of being on the environment. Um, the project I'm talking about today um, was my, everything from my undergraduate honors thesis all the way to my dissertation and is now my book. Um, it's entitled The Dam Fighters and it's about this group of grassroots environmental activists who called themselves the Upper French Broad Defense Association, hence the UFBDA. Um, they also called themselves the Dam Fighters because they opposed the Tennessee Valley Authority's plan for 14 dams on the French Broad River. Uh, they formally banded together in Western North Carolina in and around Asheville in 1970 and by 1972 through their uh, different uh, communication techniques and public participation, the TVA pulled the project off the table. And so my research really looks at how they were successful, um, the communication strategies that they used and how those could be implemented in future environmental controversies as well. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about dams. I'm gonna talk about archival research, environmental rhetoric, and the digital humanities project I have about the dam fighters. So, you know, like many good ideas, uh, this sort of project on, TVA opposition, it started with just general intellectual curiosity about dams themselves. As a child, I grew up going to Douglas Dam that uh, created like Douglas in East Tennessee that was built in record time um, before World War II. As an undergraduate, I gave kayaking tours and nature walks around this dam um, in Glendale, South Carolina that once powered uh, a textile mill. I also kind of became obsessed with the idea of the control of nature, right? This fusion of you know engineering feats and human um, control of landscapes like rivers, um, like John McPhee talks about in the book, The Control of Nature, particularly in terms of like trying to hold something as grand as the Mississippi in place. Um, there's something there, right? That arrogance to some degree of thinking that we can control a river and control nature. Similarly, one of my favorite musicians, Towns Van Zant, talks about um, that you know, this idea that you could seal the river at its mouth and take the water prisoner. All of these were kind of floating in my mind, you know, um, throughout my own intellectual development. That really kind of uh, changed as I encountered archival research as even an undergraduate, but continued up my doctoral studies. As an undergrad, I actually did an internship at the Western Regional Archives in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, the Western Regional Archives was opened in the early 2010s as a branch of the State Archives in North Carolina to basically bring records that pertain to the Western mountainous part of the state back home. Um, while I was there, 
I discovered the UFBDA records um, of the Dan Fighters, right? This group of grassroots activists who collaborated across four counties in West North Carolina during the 1960s and early 70s to ask questions, voice their opposition, and create opportunities for public participation to weigh in on this environmental decision if TVA was going to dam the French Broad River or not. Throughout my uh, research so far, and as I'm shaping out my book, and I'm, I'm interested in the ways that like archives do pertain to issues in STEM and the humanities, of course, but that they are rhetorical, right? That archives are created with this idea of, you know, purpose, context, and audience in mind. Um, in my current book project, I do know that the archives are incomplete, right? There's only certain, you know, by happenstance, by serendipity, whatever you want to call it, there's only certain archival documents that get made into <laughs> archival collections. So I'm currently, you know, conducting oral history interviews and ethnographic observations of some of the areas that would have been damned by the TVA's plan. Archives are also inherently fractured and they're reflective of existing power structures, right? Especially institutional archives like the one run by the state. And lastly, you know, a lot, a lot of people in my own field are interested in archival sources for contemporary environmental rhetoric um, issues, but I am. I think archival sources and, you know, the stories that we tell ourselves about environmental activism, in particular from the past, can help shape um, what we do in the future. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about environmental rhetoric, what that means, maybe how that might be useful to other projects as well. So essentially rhetoric has evolved over time, right? If you go back to Aristotle and the ancient Greeks, it was all about persuasion, right? Like how do I convince you of my point? Um, around the mid 1950s and things like that, um, additional scholars started to think about rhetoric a little bit more broadly, right? Thinking about rhetoric as persuading others, but also inciting action and demonstrating different points of view. But now even more recently, we expand, have expanded the definition of rhetoric to be that it's a study and a practice, right? And it's not just about words. Um, it's kind of like much more inclusive of what is used to um, influence specific audiences that are, you know, dependent on context, time, place, things like that. Um, I particularly am fond of this definition of rhetoric, right, where it's a rational study and artful practice. Um, we teach our students to think about it and we teach them to use it as they write and uh, communicate. Um, and it's about, it is about human symbol use. So in that way, it is rooted in humanities. But because of the broader implications of this, right, that you're thinking about rhetoric, where and when those symbols can target identifiable communities of interest um, to create, enhance, undermine, or otherwise influence human belief, attitude, emotion, judgment, and behavior. So it's a bit of everything in, in the best way possible. For me, environmental rhetoric um, is both a way of knowing and a way of being. And my work in particular is focused on approaching um, environmental justice and ethical environmental decision making through communication processes. Um, particular with the case of the dam fighters, I really want to highlight for my audiences um, how this particular group was able to expand public participation and access to the decision of whether or not to dam the river. Yeah, and so lastly, um, I do have a digital humanities site that I've curated um, called The Dam Fighters. I use this site a lot to, I guess, speak um, in other courses. I did this in the Honors College with Dr. Shay Tubery uh, with a course on water issues uh, last fall. Um, on this site, I have a historic overview that's written for, it's based on the publication, but this version of the overview on this site is written for the broadest public audience in mind. Um, I also have, with the permission of the Western Regional Archives, I have archival documents linked under the read tab of this site. I've digitized oral histories under the listen and I have a short documentary film um, which talks about the, the overall battle that this group endeavored over you know almost a decade to preserve their local landscape and oppose the TVA. Okay that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much Savannah. Um, that was a very interesting overview of, of the the different um, uh, of how you got involved in the waters as well. I thought, thought that was really interesting to lead you up to this point. I'm always interested in like research agendas and how you get there. So <laughs> very Thank you. Neat. Um, all right, next we have Nicole Villavail uh, from Applied Design. And the um, title of this is Clothes and Computers, Making the Physical Virtual. Nicole? So let me share my screen here, and you should be able to see it now. So, uh, so good afternoon. My name is Nicole Villarreal. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Applied Design, Apparel Design, and Merchandising. So even though fashion and fashion studies are considered part of the humanities, there's been an overlap with STEM. For example, first, uh, we look at the technology that has been used, at least since the Industrial Revolution, to manufacture clothing. And even before that, um, we use geometry 
to do pattern drafting for patterns for clothing. Um, as you can see from this image that's going to show up next once I, yes, uh, from a, a tailoring book from 1579 by Juan de Alcega, um, and it's called Libro de Geometria, Practica y Traza. And um, so while the geometry that is used to draft patterns hasn't changed much, the introduction and use of CAD in the textile and apparel industry has. So one of the biggest inventions, I think, in the last decade or so has been the use of 3D apparel simulation software, which allows manufacturers to produce virtual samples instead of physical samples. So um, that was very time and cost, uh, time consuming and costly. So before manufacturers would have to make anywhere from two to six physical samples before putting a garment into production. But nowadays, a company like Walmart only allows one physical sample to be made, and the rest is done through virtual sampling. So here's an example from Clo. This is one of the 3D apparel simulation software programs that are being used in the industry. It's the one that I like to use. And so you see on the left, the 2D pattern. Um, the center is the virtual sample. So that one was developed with the Clo software. And then here on the right, you see the manufacturer sample. So the physical sample, the real sample. Um, so another great thing about this software is besides drafting it in 2D and then putting it together virtually, you can put it on an avatar so you can see what it looks like on a body. So here is an example of a design that I made. And um, you can also use it for presentation purposes like I've done in this slide. So I have a couple of designs and then I can put them in a specific environment to show to a customer. But um, I think that the best part really is um, you can also let it move. So you can put it on an avatar and have the avatar move. And that is just really important because it allows you to see how a garment behaves. So clothes have a dual dimensionality. So they are two dimensional objects when they're not worn, but once on the body, they become three dimensional. And that putting it on an avatar like this allows us to appreciate and understand their function and form. So let me show you briefly how that process is done. Um, you draft after designing a garment, you create a flat pattern in the 2D window. This is what it looks like. You place it around the avatar and you virtually sew it together. And basically the program does that for you. You can then um, add texture and color to the fabric as I have done here uh, for a dress that I designed, which is currently part of the transformation exhibit, which is at the Church and Center for the Visual Arts. And I placed the avatar um, in a photograph that was taken in Death Valley, and I added some motion to it. I also made a physical sample of the dress. So here you see the avatar with the dress that I recreated 3D. Then I had the fabric um, printed at Spoon Flower and made my own physical copy of that. And um, this is the display at the church and center. And then here is how I put her in um, Death Valley, California. So part of my research, which I started during my dissertation at uh, NC State uh, Wilson College of Textiles was to digitize historic costume using 3D apparel simulation software. So the problem with extant clothing is sometimes it is too fragile for display. And if it can be displayed at all, it's usually for a limited time only because of the fragility of the fibers. So the environment needs to be climate and light controlled and the garment has to be down, uh, mounted on special dress forms, which can be very expensive. So one way of circumventing these problems is through the creation of a 3D apparel simulation. So this is what I did for this silk chiffon evening dress that was in the CoStar archives of the costume program of the Department of Dramatic Art at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, one of the MFA students in the program had created a pattern diagram that I used to trace and import the pattern pieces into the closed software. So after enlarging the pieces, I linked them and had the program sew them together virtually. And so here you see how they're all linked together. Um, after that, I added fabric and characteristics and other details that were needed. So on 
this slide, you can see a close-up of the final rendering of the dress. So after all the work was done, computer renders it. And so the software also allows you to get a 360 degree view of the dress, as you can see here. So uh, one more example, I also re recreated, I recreated four garments in total, but one of them was a silk charmeuse polka dot evening gown from about 1909, 1912. As you can see from the picture, this is the lady who originally wore it, um, but the dress is in very, very poor shape. Um, the silk is shredding, there's lots of stains on it, and it cannot be displayed anymore. So creating a 3D virtual sample makes it possible in that way to keep the dress alive in the virtual realm. And so here are the pictures of the, this one almost broke the computer with the software because um, it was very demanding. And this is an early example. I did this in about 2019. I don't want to do it again, but if I did, it would be a lot better because the software has improved enormously in the meantime. Um, so the next stage for my research is I want to continue, you know, trying out old patterns and making clothes with them. But also I want to incorporate an element of augmented reality in that so that people could either dress in a uh, garment like this or be, you know, have it displayed in, in certain settings. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Maybe you almost breaking the system helped them improve it. So now they're like, oh, let's see what else we can do to make sure. This I know. Works. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Very fascinating. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Rebecca Witter from Sustainable Development. And the title of this is Where Science Meets Story, Getting to Justice Admits Excess Excrement in Eastern North Carolina. Thank you all. Just bear with me while I relearn this lesson of how to move everything around on my screen. Okay. I hope you're seeing a screen there. Yes. It's, like, it's working okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much to the Office of Research um, for inviting uh, and extending this invitation to uh, my colleague Dana Powell and myself. I'm Rebecca Witter in the Department of Sustainable Development. Uh, my background, I'm kind of trained as an environmental anthropologist, that's what my PhD is in, but um, interdisciplinary and collaborative by design, that's my um, appointment in sustainable development, among other things. So Dana couldn't be here today, and my talk represents not only our collaboration, but a, um, a, a broader and deeper collaboration among university and community-based collaborators who I'll introduce in a minute. Um, before I do so, I want to draw our attention to the images on this screen. On the left, these are water samples that um, collaborators and I collected in September 2021 at houses um, res from residents in Sampson County who were concerned about their water quality. So we open the tap, let it run for two minutes, um, collect the, the water in the bottle, label it, put it on ice, and then bring it back to to be tested in labs at UNC and App State. On the right, this is the Murphy or Quawiffel Plantation established in 1837, located near Taylor's Bridge, also in Sampson County, Eastern North Carolina. And to me, these are two quintessential, quintessential images of the science and the story of environmental injustice in Eastern North Carolina. By way of all too brief, brief background, East North Carolina has been described as the birthplace of the U.S. environmental justice movement due to the multiracial public organizing mounted against the dumping of soils contaminated by C PCBs in a predominantly Black and impoverished area of rural Warren County, North Carolina. And as the actions that um, the, the public actions that contributed to the launching of a nationwide and eventually a transnational environmental justice movement, environmental injustice across Eastern North Carolina mounted and um, sustained itself um, in large part in the context of industrialized hog industry. Industrialized, sorry, hog agriculture is what I meant to say. So in the 1990s, then Virginia-based Smithfield Foods established thousands of concentrated animal feeding operations or CAFOs across the region. 
As North Carolina became the second largest hog producer in the U.S., hogs began to outnumber people, industrialized hog growers replaced small farmers, and hog waste became a new entity on the landscape managed through a controversial lagoon and spray field system. So Sampson County presently hosts about 1.8 million hogs, more hogs than people. The animals live in tight quarters combined into barns. Those are those kind of shiny metal buildings here with the waste pumped out and stored in lagoons. Um, in this case, the lagoon is overflowing, but when that's not the case, it's distributed in the form of spray fields. Um, and industrialized hog feces through, through this kind of process of confinement, containment, and then distribution, um, contamination incur occurs. So industrialized hog feces contain pathogens, heavy metals, and antibiotic resistant bacteria that growers store in these large open pit lagoons. And when, when they spray the waste onto nearby fields, they release air and waterborne contaminants. Airborne emissions from industrialized hog operations have been linked to respiratory dysfunction, mood disorders, compromised immune function, anemia, kidney disease, tuberculosis, and low birth weight. The impacts to water include contamination, harmful algae blooms, fish kills, and eutrophication in rivers and estuaries, especially when hurricane floods um, flood the intercoastal plains with industrialized animal waste. Recently, the confluence of industrialized pork and poultry operations, which I don't have time to really get into, and unprecedented flooding from hurricanes has led scholars to identify an existing and intensifying water contamination crisis in this region. And this is part of the context wherein we co-founded in 2020 the Eastern North Carolina Environmental Justice Collaborative, or EJ Colab. And this is a collection of community-based environmental defenders and uni university-based environmental scholars and our students working to advance understandings of environmental justice through an ethic and method of knowledge co-production and through intentional reliance on science and story. And I see that Shay Tuberi is here. Thanks, Shay, and Ben Pluska as well. Um, in this, uh, in the next couple of minutes, I also want to draw attention to Dan Danielle Melvin Kuntz, who I'm thinking and um, with most directly in the next few slides. <clears throat> Among the projects where this commitment to science meeting story shows up is a focus since 2021 on this community-based water quality testing initiative in Sampson County, where due to the excess excrement, a lot of shit, linked to industrialized hog operations, as well as contaminants coming from the largest landfill in the state, that's in Sampson County, and due to the lack of access to water infrastructure throughout the county, people have expressed a concerns about their drinking water. So across our team, we've collected about 160 samples gathered from people's homes, primarily the water that they're drinking from wells, but in some cases, they're also municipal water sources. And then Che Tuberty has also done a lot of surface water sampling, um, which I'm not gonna be able to touch on now. Um, and tested that water, those water samples for nutrients, anions, E. coli, heavy metals, and PFAS. We also have an accompanying survey and interviews um, where we can get at people's basic demographic information and their concerns. And when the uh, really where we're focusing on the storing is through participant observation, oral history interviews, event analysis, and toxic tours where people to, uh, kind of lead their own tours of the landscapes in ways that counter popular economic development um, initiatives. And there's actually a digital archiving component of these toxic tours that I'd love to talk to you about sometime, Savannah, among other things. <clears throat> so the point of this mixed method approach that I try to outline in that previous slide and of assuring that science meets story. In my time left, I want to emphasize two points for this. First, improved understandings of environmental harm. So environmental assessment procedures enable scientists to identify the presence or absence of, indi of individual contaminants by isolating chemicals, for example, in our water samples, to determine whether they are harmful and at what dose. The assumption that being, um, that, and, and this is based on the assumption that beans can assimilate certain levels of contamination before harm occurs. While this approach can and has been effective, indeed essential, including in identifying the harms I just named a minute ago, 
It can also narrow analytics of harm to chemical exposures and can obscure recognition of the ways that vulnerable and historically marginalized groups might experience and respond to contamination and the multiple sources of exposure. Let's take the odor of industrialized hog operations, which is noxious, causing nausea, embarrassment, disorientation, and social losses. A common refrain among residents we've had the chance to talk to, the dignity lost as people cease culturally meaningful practices like gardening, going for walks, or gathering outside to share food. Residents trace that loss of dignity not only to what may or may not show up in our test of these bottles, but also to le legacies of coloniality and enslavement. This brings me to the second point of our mixed methods approach or our commitment to science meeting story. In their scholarship and story of science, Sylvia Winter and Catherine McKittrick critique the Darwinian legacy in Western epistemologies that reduces humanity to a purely biological and natural being. They counter that humans are also fundamentally cognitive and creative beings who produce the aesthetic script of humanists. Humans are bio and logos. We are biology and myth. So what's at stake here is not only improved understandings of environmental harms and its impacts, but it's also improved understandings of what it means to be human and what it means to be human in relation to and with changing environments in an era variously termed Anthropocene, Manthropocene, Capitalocene, Plantationocene. On March 3rd, 2023, I rode with Danielle Kuntz, Ben Pluska, and Becca Nielsen to collect a sample from a home where people had concerns about the safety of their water. And route, we passed the murky plantation. Kuntz asked if we'd heard about it. We hadn't and asked if she might share. So we collected the water, put it on ice, turned around and parked out in front. Kuntz's story moved in and out of this plantation. She shared that Murphy owned 114 enslaved Africans on this land, and that many African Americans in the county descend from those people. This includes Danielle's great grand great great grandfather on her mother's side, as well as relatives on her father's. She also reflected on the columns, their persistence in houses today, and the meanings that they continue to smuggle in to hold up, and on the grace she feels for her people today how she plans to take her sons here to thank their ancestors. As, ha as I heard her do in other contexts, Kuntz linked the oppression of enslavement to the oppression of industrialized agriculture. Others have done this too. So we see in this map counties with the highest percentage of enslaved people historically in Eastern North Carolina overlaid with present day sites of industrialized agriculture. Sampson County is here in dark red and dotted black. <clears throat> Exposure to industrial harms means being means being less than human, harkening back to a time when the economy assumed and assured that people were treated the same. Moving forward, we can't understand what shows up in the bottle, separate in our tests of these bottles, separate, separately from what shows up in people's stories. If university-based researchers hope to understand environmental harm, they need to take seriously the full scope of sources of harm, both the scientific study of contamination and the story of people's landscapes and livescapes. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rebecca. <coughs> um, uh, you told a story through that entire presentation. Um, very interesting, thank you so much. Uh, um, our next presenter is Richard Oliver. I say that right? I keep... <laughs> <laughs> and from Applied Design. And the title of this is Organic 3D Modeling in Biology and Design. All right. Are you seeing my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and, and thank you for the time. Um, let me just get some things rearranged here. All right. Uh, so yeah, I teach in the Department of Applied Design. Um, my background is a combination of craft and industrial design. So I come from a background in, in jewelry prior to working in industry. Um, so on the left, you have an example of a ring from many years ago. And on the right is a tennis racket that I worked on for Wilson Sports uh, back in my design consulting days. And the work that I do now always brings together pieces and parts from those two different worlds and, and more and more uh, investigations into biology. So, sorry, there we go. 
So here's, uh, I'll just run through some past projects and then get to a more current one to, to focus on, but just some examples of past work using uh, mathematical structures and references in the natural world as the basis for design objects. And so this one on the upper left is based on this sort of fractal branching pattern. This is a, sort of a conceptual bowl design. Uh, this is a base series based on seagrass and uh, another bowl based on uh, the growth of malachite crystals and simulating those forms in nature. Um, is there a couple of different objects based on cellular structures, and that seems to be something I've, I've hung out with for a while, um, but using cellular patterns to create structures. And in, in particular, uh, a lot of this work is done using 3D printing and trying to be very mindful of the amount of material being used, uh, looking to nature as an efficient source of sort of structure through minimal use of material. And so that's where a lot of this cell structure work comes from. Um, a more recent series, uh, Voronoi vase on the right and this fruit bowl on the left. And these are you know, 14 inches tall. The fruit bowl is about 16 inches across. Um, but again, 3D printed work uh, developed through simulations in, in software to create these structures that mimic uh, forms and patterns in nature and then materializing them using uh, 3D printing and different different coding processes. Uh, one last past example, this is a, a series of silverware, and again, looking to biology, both for the form inspiration, but then also thinking about uh, individuation. So uh, in these, you know, I was writing programs to generate variants in the forms. So instead of, you know, typically in industrial design, we're focused on mass production, right? You, you create one thing thousands and thousands of times, uh, but looking back to my craft background, trying to create variants where each item is individualized, but using this, this new technology to produce it. And so uh, for these, I was writing programs, and each time you would run a program, it would generate a new fork or a new spoon or a new knife, and each one would have some differences from the last one. And then those would be 3D printed in wax and then cast in silver. More recently, and this is uh, an ongoing project, this is part of the, the Turchin exhibition transformations that Nicole mentioned. Uh, that's up through the semester, if you haven't gotten a chance to see it. Uh, it's 10 faculty from art and design uh, using digital fabrication and digital design tools. But I've been looking at these little tiny microorganisms. Uh, they're called radiolaria. Uh, these are ocean-borne microbes that, uh, when they die, they leave behind these fantastically complex exoskeletons. And those are used uh, quite a bit in geology for dating. As these species evolve over time, they sort of uh, indicate when that sediment was created based, you know, based on the different exoskeletons that are left within it. And so uh, I've been looking at a number of different sources for these. And for this project, really, the, the push for me was to not only just reference these things. I think in the past, I was guilty of the designer's model of, of just borrowing from uh, nature as an inspiration, the sort of the lowest level of, of uh, biomimetic design. Um, and in this, I wanted to actually try to more closely replicate or duplicate things that were found in nature. And so these are three different sources. The one on the left, this is an electron microscope image of a specific radiolaria exoskeleton. Uh, the one in the middle is an illustration by uh, the biologist and illustrator Ernst Haeckel. And then on the right is a written description of another radiolaria. And I use that as the, the basis of, a, of another creation. Um, so this is a little bit of the process. So again, on the left-hand side, you have this micros electron microscope image of a Nasolaria exoskeleton, and you can kind of see the size of this thing. It's, it's quite small. It's only about four thousandths of an inch uh, high, and you know, a piece of paper is about three thousandths of an inch thick. So that's, that's the size of these things in nature. And then uh, I'm using um, different software along the way. So uh, this is an example of using Grasshopper, which is a procedural modeling software, which is a visual programming interface in 3D modeling to create these uh, complex structures. And then I'm bringing that out of, um, I love these. It's funny that I, it's just hitting me. We use these animal named software, right? So this is Grasshopper and this is Rhino. And I'm modeling these things from nature, these software. Yeah. And then... Um, this one, not an animal name, but ZBrush. So then I bring it into ZBrush for uh, different post-processing of the form to smooth things out and sculpt some specific details. 
Um, it's an evolutionary process for me, this iterative process, I guess, maybe not evolutionary, but you see, you know, these are just models captured throughout the process, right? So just starting with very rectilinear things, moving to more and more complex curvilinear forms. Um, and then once I get something that I feel like represents that, that model from nature, then I start to simplify and modify it to make something that I can use as a, as a jewelry object. And all along the way, these are being 3D printed and tested. So as it's being made on the screen, it's also being made physically in this kind of test of from virtual to mechanical back and forth to refine the details of the design. And so this is a first series. So on the left-hand side, you have the, the model of that Nessalaria skeleton. And this is 3D printed. It's about four inches tall. And then you have what I call this intro model. This I call this a de-evolution of species. So sort of modeling the biological and then starting to simplify and modify that for a design application. So this is this kind of intro model starting to change the form, take away some of the pointy bits, and then getting to this model, which is then 3D printed as a jewelry object and coated using a, um, a polymer coating. And these actually have pearls set in the bottom and sterling silver ear wires. So um, creating these as a series, I also made a, a pendant design based on that same pattern. And you know, this is sort of the, the collection, another one with a, a pearl set in it. So again, the goal was to not just look, but to try to replicate and then use that as a study to create these design objects. Um, so I've done three of these so far. The second one was based on uh, this illustration by Haeckel. So this is a Paracanthia exoskeleton. I still love reading about his work. He was one of the first to really document radiolaria and start to try to categorize and name these, figure out a nomenclature for them. And uh, he used to basically do these illustrations with one eye on the microscope and the other eye on a sketch page. And I still marvel at his ability to get that level of detail just with uh, a piece of paper. Um, and so this is my recreation of that exoskeleton. So this was you know, 3D printed about you know, five inches or so, um, but using the same kind of process, going back and forth through multiple pieces of software to try to replicate that complexity and then simplifying it down. This is that intro model in this devolution series. And then on the right-hand side, that's the model that then became uh, this silver brooch. So that same form was then printed in wax and cast in sterling. Um, and then the last one was based on this written description on the right. The, it's an, a cantharia skeleton. I don't speak Latin. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, but um, that's the best I can do. Uh, this is a similar uh, version, but they, I couldn't find an example of this one, but I decided to just try to go by this written description. And um, it, was, it was a fun challenge to just think about how do you describe this kind of complex geometry. Um, and in the end, this was the, the model that I came up with on the left. And again, this, this devolution series getting to this model on the right, which was then made into a series of jewelry, uh, earrings and pendant. And all of these are uh, on display. This is another necklace made from that same design. Um, I'll jump here and then come back. So here's a display on the lower left. This is what you might see at the Turchin Center of one of these, these series. And then um, the picture from the gallery. So again, there's there's ten different uh, artists and designers in that gallery, including Nicole, who presented uh, a little bit earlier. This last one, I just want to show. So now I'm in some discussions with different faculty in the biology department, trying to find other applications for this. So. Uh, the Radiolaria project was really more of a passion project for me, just trying to go to the source. And now uh, talking with uh, a couple different faculty in biology about how we might use those same modeling approaches to create things that might have value in their academic world, either for teaching or research. So this is a electron microscope image of an embryo of a fern. And I'm working with Dr. Howe on how to essentially what the electron microscope can do is create a series of planar images. And so using those planar images, now we're working to reconstruct three-dimensional cells of that uh, embryo so it can be studied a little bit more intricately. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, all of you, um, Savannah and Nicole. Rebecca and Richard uh, for this really exciting, fascinating presentations. Thank you very much.